Testing, praise the Lord. There we go. All right, hallelujah. Well, be- woo, haha. before I get started, I have something I got to do. I did not bring my own gift. Okay. <laughs> go with me to Hebrews 6.10. <clears throat> Pastor Andrew, this is really for Jerry Lynn. You get a book. But Hebrews, besides it's Mother's Day, you know, Hebrews 6.10 says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have showed towards his name, and that you have ministered to these saints. Come on. And you continue to minister. I I have pastored churches, I have worked on church staffs, I've taught in the Christian school here for many years, I've taught in Bible schools, I've actually pastored a church, I have a son who's a pastor, and y'all don't know, I'm just saying, you know, I used to think, oh, you know, get up and preach on Sunday, what is there, you know, how hard can that be? This couple has given their lives for this body right here at Southgate Church. And they have served faithfully through thick and thin. Let me tell you what. They have stood in faith. They have walked in love. I'm so honored to call them my friends and co-laborers in Christ. And I just had to bless Jerry Lynn. Come on. Give it up for Pastor Andrew and Jerry Lynn. We love you. I'm not going to make you walk up here. God love you. We love you so much. The Bible says to give honor to whom honor is due, you know, and they they deserve much more than that, but I I only have so much time this morning. (laughs) Praise the Lord. (laughs) My husband is here. I want to acknowledge him, too. Um, He's a Marine. Any other Marines in here? Ooh, rah, rah. Uh, (laughs) Any um, Navy? Anybody? Navy veterans? Yeah, you guys used to give him a ride. The Navy gave him a ride. The Marines, that's their job. Yeah, come on. Air Force, Army, I know you served in the Army. Thank you all for serving. Thank you all who served. Uh, My husband is such a blessing. He'll be back at the book table. I do have some books. This was the first of the set out there I have called um, How to Never Fail for Parents. I wrote this several years ago, and it's how I raised my kids, and it's applying 1 Corinthians 13 to parenting. Most people don't do that. You apply it to marriage, yada, yada, but it says love never fails. And if you want to never fail as a parent, you know, why not use what the Bible says? But, of course, this, Bible, this book goes through what the Bible means when it says love never fails. You know, love doesn't mean you just let your kids do whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want, say whatever they want to you. You know, sometimes love does overlook things like your mama did, you know. Um, praise God. So this is good for parents. This is a book, Stuff Happens, Hope Anyway, H-O-P-E. The Lord gave me an acronym for that. And it's have only positive expectations. Uh, This is the story of what happened in my life. Oh, gosh, about like how many years ago? 15, 13 years ago or something? 13 years ago. I was married to a man for 30 years. We were married for 30 years. Uh, We were in the ministry together. We were pastoring a church together in West Texas. And then one day the FBI followed him into our house. And my life completely changed. Talk about the rug being pulled out from under your life. How many of you ever felt that happen? Something happened. You got a diagnosis. You got a phone call. Something happened. It's like, oh, your life totally changed. (laughs) That's what this book is about. I really encourage you to get it because everybody goes through stuff. And, And it's not just my tale of woe. It's a tale of victory and how God got me through. And then this is my most recent book. I just released it like a week ago. And the best part of this book is the foreword. Some of you read it. Because the foreword was written by Pastor Andrew Cunningham. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So that's out there. Um, This is Prayers of Reassurance in a Time of Uncertainty. And a couple years ago, I started going through the Bible, doing a private Bible study on justice. I saw things happen, and I thought, God, this doesn't seem right. You know, I know right from wrong. This doesn't seem right. And uh, I started doing my own personal Bible study on justice, and I wrote scriptures down. That's what I do in my journal. I, like, write the whole thing out. And so I had page after page after page. 
there are a lot of Bible verses about justice, a lot. And so just a few months ago, the Lord said, you need to put that in a book because people need to pray the word about what God says, not pray against this political figure and pray for this political figure and pray for this party and, and pray down this party. No, just pray God's word and let him figure it out because we only know what we know. So stop by the book table. My husband, Mike, will be back there. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm so honored to be here. I know the first service was totally different than I expected. We're going to see what God's going to do here today. Um, you know, like Pastor Andrew, my mama moved to heaven a couple years ago. And that's what I say. She moved to heaven. She moved to heaven. I know she did. And I, should, I know she would not trade places with me for anything in the world. And, and I miss her, you know, I wish she was here, but I'm glad she's not suffering anymore, you know. I'm glad she's in glory, and heaven is real to me. I, 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 if I could ask God to do anything for you today, I would ask that he would make heaven so real to you that nothing, nothing shakes your tree. You know, when heaven is so real to you, it's like, eh, you know, I'll get through this. Heaven's real, and that's where I'm going. Right, Laura? Isn't that right? Heaven's real, and that's where we're going. But, you know, mothers, and, and I feel like there might be some women in here who have been wanting to conceive a child, and I think, um, you know, that, that can make Mother's Day hard, too. Um, if there are some married women in here, I really highly recommend you be married first. But if there are some married women in here who have been wanting to conceive, I, I believe we're going to pray for in, in a few minutes about something in particular the Lord's put on my heart. And I believe God's going to move. And... He can, he can fix things in your body, in your husband's body, whatever has to be fixed. He wants you to have babies, amen, and raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. But moms carry their babies in their womb for nine months, but they carry them in their heart forever, don't they? Isn't that right, Laura? You carry your babies forever, your children as adults forever. And Christian moms don't just carry them in their hearts. Christian moms hold them up in prayer. Always, regardless of whether they're walking with God right now or they're not. Moms always pray for their kids and their grandkids. And I look out here, and I see some moms. I know you're praying moms. I know you're praying for your kids. Don't give up. Some of you out here are, about, are like the woman we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about one indefatigable woman. Isn't that a good word? Indefatigable. I love that word. I could have used a different word. But when I was preparing this, this word just it, just, it just sounds so powerful, so serious. So like, well, let's look at the definition of indefatigable. Indefatigable means having or showing a capacity for persistent effort and not relenting. Not giving up. Indefatigable. Don't give up. You want to be indefatigable in your faith. Indefatigable in your love towards your kids and your spouse indefatigable. I will not give up. I don't care what it looks like. I'm going to continue to pray. I'm going to continue to believe. I will be indefatigable. Everybody say indefatigable. Isn't that just a great word? We're going to look at one indefatigable woman in scripture. Now, I'm sure all over the country today, people are honoring women and mothers in the pulpit by preaching about some of the famous women. Now, I'd like you to talk to me. Is that okay? Will you, can you talk to me out there? Okay. Um, like famous women in the Bible, name some. Esther. Esther, yeah. Oh, I know somebody's preaching about Esther today. How about somebody else? Anybody else? Ruth. Oh, come on. And, and her mother-in-law, Naomi, come on. Mother-in-law, loving the mother-in-law, that's important. Amen. <laughs> Ruth and Naomi. Um, Deborah, oh, man, she's my kind of girl. Deborah, man, led the nation led him into victory against Sisera, who had like 900 iron chariots. I mean, and Deborah, a woman, led them. Okay, yeah. Okay, but we're going to talk about one indefatigable woman who's unnamed. She's not named. And actually, if you look at Scripture, there are several indefatigable women who aren't even named. And I don't know about you, but I don't, I, I don't care if anybody knows my name except Jesus. When I come before the throne, I want him to say, oh, I know you. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come on. So there are several indefatigable women in Scripture. We don't even know who they are. And you might feel that way. You might feel like nobody knows who I am. 
Nobody cares. Oh, God knows. You know, one of those women was the widow of Zarephath in 1 Kings. How many of you remember her story? Elijah, there was a famine going on, and God sent the prophet Elijah to this widow who had a son to feed. Now, widows in those days, they didn't have social security. You hear what I'm saying? She was poor. There was a famine. She had no food. And the prophet comes and says, make me a cake first. What? I have a son. We're going to eat this and die. Oh, the prophet said, well, just make me a cake. Okay, what'd she do? She made him a cake, and God blessed her, and she and her son had food until the famine was over. And then there's the, um, the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings. Oh, there's a, there's a big story about her, but here's why she was indefatigable. She had one son that came as a miracle. That's a word for somebody here. That son came as a miracle. She didn't think she could have a child, and then all of a sudden the son died. And so you know why she was indefatigable? She picked up that dead body. She picked up that dead body, and she started running to the prophet because she knew the power of God could raise her son from the dead. And as she ran to that prophet with that dead child in her arms, people would say, "Uh, what's wrong, woman? What's the problem? Is everything okay? And she would say, it is well. It is well. Now that, my friends, is an indefatigable spirit. It's like, yeah, everything's a mess. Everything's a mess. I got a bad report. But you know what? I trust God, and it is well. But the one indefatigable woman we're going to look at today is in Luke um, chapter 18. And this is a message for all of us today because Jesus said it was especially for those of us who are living in the last days. And um, I have the inclination, but not the time, (laughs) to talk about end times. Jesus is coming pretty soon. Woo, he's coming. Even if I'm wrong. Could be. I could be wrong. But everything's in place, y'all. Like I said, I'm not going to talk about that today. I I like to tell people, look, you don't know when Jesus is coming. It could be, you know, it could be another thousand years. Well, Revelation 1.1 says, I'm writing these things that are soon to come to pass. Now, if they were soon to come to pass in Revelation 1, 2,000 years ago, how much sooner are they to come to pass now? So, just saying, Jesus wrote this to this generation in particular, this parable. Jesus didn't write it. Jesus gave this parable. So Luke 18, 1 through 3 in the NLT says, One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. Woo! Who was he talking to? His disciples. What's a disciple? Somebody tell me. What's a disciple? Follower. Yeah. So we have any of those in here? Any followers of Jesus? I'm a follower. Okay. So this is to all of us. This is not just to the women. This is to every follower of Jesus. Verse 2. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. This is one indefatigable woman. What was Jesus trying to teach us here? He was trying to teach us that we should always pray and not give up. He wants us to be indefatigable, unrelenting. I will always pray. I will continue to pray. Now, one of my favorite scriptures, there's lots of scriptures in the Bible that talk about praying a lot, praying all the time, praying always. One of my favorites is Ephesians 6, 18, which I'm going to use King James because I memorized that one. It says, praying always, somebody say always, with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, praying always. If we couldn't Pray always. Why would God tell us to do it? That's pretty mean and rude and nasty. I say it must be possible to pray always. All right, I know that sounds kind of out there. But but we can pray always. Now, in Ephesians 6.18, it says praying always with all prayer. Now, some versions of the Bible might say all kinds of prayer. Any of your Bibles say that? Or different kinds of prayer. There are different kinds of prayer. That's how you can pray always. There are different kinds of prayer. We're going to talk about a couple of them. 
One is the prayer of supplication. And you see that here, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. A supplication is a humble, earnest, come on, it's not a mamsy, pamsy, wimpy, yada, yada, yada. It's a mm, humble, earnest, heartfelt entreaty or request. And supplication, you can pray it for yourself, but mamas know how to pray that for their kids. Come on. So that's one kind of prayer. Another kind of prayer is intercession. We see that in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. It says, um, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, before you do anything else, supplications, there's that supplications again, intercessions, it's a different word in the Greek, I'm not going to go into all that, supplications, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men and for all that in authority that we may live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Okay, so we're supposed to pray for people in authority. Why? So we can, the church can live a quiet and peaceable life. So we can do what God called us to do. So they'll just leave us alone. Amen. <laughs> I'm just saying. Okay. All right, another type of prayer is the prayer of praise and worship. And this church has always been anointed, has always had an anointing for that. You keep flowing. Alyssa, Alyssa Cowles, in the name of Jesus, your team, I speak life, I speak energy, I speak fresh fire and fresh oil. I speak freshness, freshness, freshness. You get before God, you bring his presence in here because you do it at home, alone, on your own. And when you come up here, the presence of God is thick. You don't have to have all kinds of fancy, you don't have to have an orchestra. Listen, the presence of God is all you need, and you are anointed to bring it. Be encouraged. Let's just give our worship team, just encourage them. Now, um, in the last service, I felt led that the congregation needed to pray a particular prayer. But in this service, I kind of feel like this crew here needs to pray a different prayer. And that's the prayer of consecration. I don't even think we talked about it last service. The prayer of consecration is the one where you say, if it be thy will. That's the kind of prayer Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember that? He said, Father, I want this cup to pass by me. But if not, thy will be done. If it be thy will. It was like what Mary said when the angel said, you are, you are a virgin. You are going to remain a virgin. But inside you, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and you are going to conceive the Messiah. And you know what she said? Be it done unto me according to thy... Let's do that again. That's pretty good. Be it done unto me according to thy... That is the prayer of consecration. And I feel like that's the one we need to pray in this, in this service today. Um, first service, we prayed the prayer of commitment, which is casting all your cares upon him. Some of you probably need to do that, too. You're carrying a bunch of worries, and God says, no, you need to cast your cares. 1 Peter 5, 7, you can flash that up there if you want. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, um, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares on him. How many of you have ever, ever gone fishing? What do you call that? Yeah. But see, here's the problem. When people pray, they act like they're fishing, and they reel it back in. <laughs> Don't be reeling it back in, all right? Cast your cares, and then let it go. I like to say this, cast your cares at the altar of prayer and leave it there. God did not intend for you to be walking around with a 50-pound backpack full of trouble. Leave it all at God's feet, casting all your cares upon him. And so part of this, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he will exalt you in due time, also has to do with this prayer of consecration. When you're in the right place, oh, come here, come here. When you're in the right place, when you have consecrated your life to God, and you are doing what God has told you to do, come on, the best you can. You know, okay, go ahead, Holy Ghost. Here we go. I don't know where I'm going to end up, but I'll end up somewhere. See, sometimes we want to hear from God like every detail. Okay, so where should I work, and how much should I make, and Exactly what should I do? Da, 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 da. And then we sit around on our blessed assurance and do nothing. You know what I'm saying? By your blessed ass. 
insurance. Yeah. <laughs> but, and sometimes God tells us he wants you to do something and we don't want to do it. Ooh, Jesus. When God told me I needed to move to Detroit, Michigan to go to Bible school, I got on that airplane crying, crying, crying. The flight attendants came up to me and said, ma'am, are you okay? No! I don't want to move to Detroit! Ah! I cried every day for almost two years, y'all, to move from Arizona ooh, to Detroit, Michigan. Come on now. But I had said, God, your will be done. If God says you teach in that little Christian school at 2020 East Baseline Road and you do it with joy for the next 20 years, you say, God, your will be done. He'll take care of you. He'll meet your needs. He'll bless you coming in and going out. If he says, you, you have been coming to this church for a long time and you haven't started volunteering yet, oh, God's saying, they need help. They need, I haven't talked to Pastor Andrew. He didn't tell me to say this, okay? I'm just following the Holy Ghost. He did not tell me to say this. They need help in, in, their, in their children's church, and they need help in the school, and they need help with, with welcoming visitors. You know what? It's time to say, thy will be done. Oh, but I'd have to get up an hour earlier. <laughs> thy will be done. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You don't know what's going to get started when you obey. So let's just lift up our hands. Let's just pray this, this prayer of consecration. Father, I thank you. We just lay our lives in your hands. We put our lives in your hands. Father, and I look down here at Pastor John's mom, and she's in her 90s, and God, you still have work for her to do. You still have prayers for her to pray. Father, I know I, I just turned old enough to to get Social Security and Medicare. But God, I know you still have work for me to do. You still have people for me to reach. Father, there are young people in here that are just trying to pay their bills and trying to get along, Lord. I just thank you that you get them in the right place, doing the right thing, that you may exalt them in due time, that promotions will come. Father, you'll show them more in the spirit. They will affect this city. They'll affect this nation. They'll be a blessing in this church. I pray for fresh oil upon everyone, everyone who is serving you here with their whole heart, Father, that they'll serve you with new fire, fresh fire and fresh passion. Thank you, Father, for moving in this place. We commit our lives to you, and we say, your will be done. And everybody said, amen. amen. Woo! Okay. So now where are we? Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. Hmm. Okay, I want to talk about communication with God. God said, the, throughout many times in Scripture, Jesus said, he taught this, this parable that you should pray, always pray, always pray, and not give up. Well, I want to talk about always praying. Um, prayer is communication with God, right? You might have some real religious idea Prayer is communicating with God. Now, I communicate with God. You know why? Because I love him. Same reason I communicate with my husband. Same reason I communicate with my kids. I love them. Now, when I communicate with my husband, our communication isn't always the same. You know, I don't always go, oh, my dear Mike, I thank you for all you've done for me. And I ask you to please take out the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> He's thinking that's a good idea. Okay. But see, when I communicate with him, sometimes we talk about heavy stuff. I mean, sometimes we can talk about deep stuff. Sometimes we can talk about emotional stuff. Sometimes we talk about things that I need. Sometimes he tells me stuff he needs. But then sometimes, you know what? We just hang out together. Come on, married folk. We've been married. It'll be 10 years in July. I can't even hardly believe that. 10 years we've been married. Amen. To God be the glory. Get my book. You've got to read my book. But, but sometimes we just, ooh, hallelujah, sometimes we just hang out. And sometimes, you know what, we can be together for a long time. Married folk know this. You can be together for a long time and not really hardly say anything. But here's what I don't do. I never ignore him. Come here. I never ignore him. How many of you are walking around all day totally ignoring God? 
Sometimes, this is one way you can pray always, y'all. You need to remember, he said he would never leave you or forsake you. You need to remember that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And, and here's, how, here's how I pray always. I'll just, like, talk to God, like, like any time, like anywhere. And people who are around me, they'll hear it, and they'll just have to get used to it, you know. They just have to get used to it. Because I'll just walk around, and I'll just go, thank you, Jesus. You know, I'll just think about something. Sometimes when, okay, now this, you're going to think I'm really crazy. Sometimes when I'm doing the laundry, I'll be like uh, hanging up one of my husband's shirts, and I'll go, thank you, God, for my husband. I love him so much. That's praying always. It's praying always. When I'm in the car and, and, and driving down the highway, I'm like, oh, God, I thank you for your protection. And sometimes I just say, I love you, Jesus. When I was working in a very, very large ministry, and I had a pretty major position, and there was some pressure in any ministry. There's pressure. You know that. And I would just walk in the halls, and I would remind myself, why, how did I get here? How did I get you know, this title and this position and yada, 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 all this stuff? How did I get here? I got here because I love Jesus. Amen. I got here because I love Jesus. And so I'd walk around with all the pressure and whatever, and I would go, I love you, Jesus. And I would say it out loud so people would hear me. I love you, Jesus. So walk with God. Talk with God. All that, that's how you can pray always. Now, I've got to get on with this because I'm whoosh. Okay. Let's go to my next point. To teach this lesson, Jesus used the illustration of an unjust judge and a widow. Now, the unjust judge is not God. You might think he's God because the widow's going to the unjust judge for something. But God is not unjust. That would be a terrible example. And it says, and Jesus said that this judge didn't, res didn't honor God or respect people. God doesn't, God loves you. God respects you. He loves you. And, and you know, Jesus used the example of a judge who was like one of the highest, most wealthy, most influential people in society, and then a widow. You know, in Jesus' day, they were pretty much the most destitute in society. So the most wealthy, influential, the most destitute. And yet this woman, who had no title, probably little or no money, no influence, kept going to this influential judge saying, give me justice. That's what my book's about back there. Give me justice. Well, now, why, why did... We don't, okay, let me ask this. Who is that unjust judge if it's not God? Do you know who it is? Judges have regional jurisdiction. Jesus didn't say the unjust king, did he? No. Judges have regional jurisdiction. Who is the judge? He's described in Ephesians 6, 12. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in High places. High places. There is a spiritual realm, y'all. God is real. Everybody say, God is real. God is real. I'm telling you. Jesus is real. The Holy Spirit is real. Angels are real. But guess what? So is the devil. And so are demons. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. But we still have principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. That means there's a second heaven. It's over the atmosphere of the earth. It's in the spiritual realm that we can't see that are influencing people of influence. Woo -hoo -hoo! Let me say that again. They're influencing people of influence. They were influencing this judge until finally the judge gave in. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 calls Satan the small case G God of this world. Small case, you know, he has some authority on this earth. Not with me. Not with you if you've given Jesus your heart. If you live for God, if you've humbled yourself before God and given him your life. Satan has no authority over you. But he's going to try to take it. He's going to try to take it unless you influence your authority like this widow did by being indefatigable. You have to influence your authority because Satan's going to take his if you don't take yours. That's not where am I. Pastor Andrew, I'm so sorry. I don't know what's happening here. I'm just following the Holy Ghost. Okay. Here's the deal. Why, why, if the unjust judge 
is principalities, powers, demons, you know, if he represents demons, why did Jesus talk about this widow going to him? It almost looks like she's praying to him. We don't pray to demons. Well, I'll tell you what. It's like Moses. How many of you remember the story of Moses? Okay? Moses got a message from God. God told him what to do, and then what did he have to do? Go to Pharaoh. Come on. Same thing with this woman. I believe she heard from God. God said, I have justice for you. I have better for you. And so she had to, you know, get dressed, go down to town, walk to town, you know, put on her head covering, put on her sandals, walk to town, maybe get an appointment, maybe wait, finally see the judge, and the judge went, denied. Okay, she has a choice then, doesn't she? She can quit or she can keep on. The word of the Lord for some of you today is keep on. Don't quit. Don't you stop coming to church. Don't you stop believing. You keep on. Don't you stop tithing. Keep on. Keep on. So, so she went back and she went back. Okay, Bible quiz number one. You can flip to that so slide. Woo. Bible quiz number one, church. How many times did Moses go to Pharaoh before he let pe God's people go? Anybody know? A lot. I counted it up. I didn't get this from a commentary. So a commentary might say different, but I counted it up 14 times. 14 times. Now you would think when, when Moses went before Pharaoh and Aaron put his rod on the ground and it turned into a snake, you would think that would be enough for Pharaoh to go, oh, okay, you did a miracle. I think I'll do what you want. But y'all, the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world and the spiritual wickedness in high places don't give up that easy. Do you hear me? The problem with the church is we give up too easy. We don't know how to be indefatigable. But we're going to learn today, amen? amen? Say, I'm indefatigable. So that brings us to Bible quiz number two. Bible quiz number two. Ooh, praise the Lord. Where in the Bible... Does it say, just quit? <laughs> Where in the Bible does it say, now would be a good time to give up? Where in the Bible does it say, you should just stop believing? It's not there, friends. It's not there. God says, continue to believe. So, ha, ha, ha. Let me, let me go on. Let me give this, I feel like I need to give this example. Let's say you're praying for your unsaved family members. How do you act like this widow or how like, like Moses? What do you do? You go before God. You lift up the names of your loved ones. You say them out loud. Let's say they're not serving God. Let's say they've, they've totally walked away from God. You lift up their names and then out loud. It doesn't have to be as loud as I am. I'm just loud, but... Out loud, you say, so every angel, come on, every demon, and you yourself hear it. You say out loud, my family shall be saved. All of Cornelius' family was saved. Come on, all of Lydia's household was saved. Psalm 112 says, the generation of the righteous shall be mighty on the earth. And I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And I say, my family shall be saved. They shall be great on this earth. They shall be known for serving God. That's what I say, and I'm sticking with it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'm, I'm going, okay, take me, Holy Ghost. Where are we going? Okay, let's go back to Luke 18, verses 4 and 5. Luke 18, verses 4 and 5 in the NLT. Jesus says that the judge said, High and mighty judge says, but this woman is driving me crazy. <laughs> I just love that, don't you? I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out. I have a question for y'all. Is the devil wearing you out or are you wearing the devil out? A lot of people are tired and weary. Uh, my son pastors a church. I, I know what's going on in the church, not this church, but a lot of people don't want to serve anymore. They don't want to be there every week anymore because they say they're just worn out. That's because they're letting the devil wear them out, and they should be wearing out the devil. How do you do that, y'all? You do it by praying. 
You do it by speaking the word, and you do it by praising God. That's why an anointed praise and worship team is so important. Listen, Psalm 149 teaches about how praise is a weapon, and I'll tell you why. Because when you say how good God is, how mighty God is, how, how great and awesome he is, how faithful he is, how holy he is, the devil doesn't want to hang around and listen. He doesn't. So, yeah, yeah, if you want to wear out the devil, okay, you want to give me a hard time, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to tell you that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I'm just going to tell you that when Jesus rose from the dead, he threw off principalities and powers. He made a show of you openly. I'm just going to tell you that your end is in the pit, in the lake of fire, and my end is in heaven with Jesus, and I am not going to listen to you anymore. Shut up of your big mouth. I'm listening to Jesus. Greater is he that's in me. I'm sticking with him. Come on. Wear out the devil. Wear him out. Woo. Okay. Somebody said, you're wearing me out, lady. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm ready to close. Hallelujah. We wear out the devil when we pray. When we praise the Lord. When we just keep saying the word. You know, oh, if you haven't read my book, The Stuff Happens, Hope Anyway, get it. I'm serious because throughout that whole, it was crazy. It was crazy, 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 crazy. Like my name was, was in the Internet, you know, all over the world. And it was like the kind of thing, like people go through divorces and problems. But this is the kind of thing that they make Lifetime movies about. It was on the news, covered by the news, front page of the paper. Listen. And you know what I did? I'm not kidding you. This is what I did. I praised the Lord. Not for the situation, but because he is still God. He is always God, and he is your way out. He is not your problem. He is always your way out. And when you fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, when you get your eyes on him, all this other stuff needs to just shut up. All right? I'm just telling you the power of praise. Okay, I'm, I'm closing up. Really, I am. Here I am. Here I go. Let me say this, though. <laughs> Let me go back. Let's go back to Luke 18. One more thing. I felt like I needed to say this. Luke 18, 6 through 8, in the NLT, the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, God will grant justice to them quickly. Look at this right here. This is what I want you to see. But when the Son of Man returns, when Jesus comes back, how many will he find on the earth who have faith when he comes back? Is he going to find you in faith? Or is he going to find you in fret? Are you fretting about things? Are you complaining about things? Are you worried about things? The King James Version says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And that word faith is not just pistis. The word uh, faith in the Greek is pistis. But this is ho pistis. Not that kind of ho. Ho, H-O in Greek means this kind of faith. When Jesus comes back, is he going to find this kind of faith? Is he going to find this kind of persistent, indefatigable faith? Or is he going to find a bunch of wimpy Christians who just say, oh, I guess it didn't work. Oh, I'm not going to be one of those. Come on. When Jesus comes back, Say, he's going to find me faithful. Say, he's going to find me faithful. All right, I'm closing up. Here it is. Here's the close. <laughs> For real. Whew. Um, God is good. Yeah, who said that? Good job. Do that again. God is good. That was good. Doesn't matter. God is good. The devil's busy on this earth. He's getting busier which is why we need to be indefatigable in our prayer, indefatigable in our stand. We need to stand on the word no matter what. God has given you enough angels, come on, to defeat any demon. And the Bible says angels hearken to the voice of the word. So when you speak God's word, you know what you do? You initiate angels to fight in that second heaven. Ooh, that's a whole other message. i got to come back and preach that message about the second heaven. All right, anyway. God has given you everything you need, y'all. In closing, I want to read a blog post I wrote five years ago. Five years ago. About two indef 
indefatigable young mothers who raised their sons right here in this church. Right here in this church. I wrote this five years ago. I had a flashback yesterday as I was worshiping God at Faith for Life Dallas. Maybe it would be better called a retrospective insight. Whatever it was, it was powerful, and you need to know about it, especially if you're involved in raising or ministering to kids, or if you attend a small church, or if you pastor a small church. Yesterday, I wasn't sitting in any church. I was in the church that my son, Matthew Tarkington, pastors. He is highly anointed. I have taught in several Bible schools and have preached from many pulpits. I know many extremely anointed younger and older preachers, and my son doesn't lag behind in any of them. And I wasn't singing just any worship song. We were singing Jesus at the Center. Israel Houghton is regarded as the composer of this song, but I knew he had help. The official lyrics include two other writers. One of them is Adam Ranny. You might know his name. If you don't, you will. I know y'all know his name, right? Maybe you've seen him on TBN. I think he's on like every other day. Adam Ranny grew up in the same church and Christian school as my son. As a matter of fact, I have the honor of being known as the music teacher who cut him from the small ensemble in junior high. <laughs> and now he's a world famous worship leader. So that's another story. But my message to the pastors is this. Both Pastor Matt and Pastor Adam spent most of their developmental years in a small church whose attendance was around a few hundred. The pastor wasn't famous. The facilities weren't fancy. The staff was small, and most of them were volunteers. My family started attending the church in 1985. I think it was actually 84, but Pastor Matt was barely two years old. Adam is several years older than Matt, but I remember him coming to the church when he was in third or fourth grade. Many of us who attended this church came out of the Jesus movement or the charismatic renewal of the late 1970s. We were sold out for Jesus. We were hungry for the word and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The pastor here preaches the word. The founding pastor and his wife graduated from the first class of Ramah. Sometimes he would flow in the gifts of the Spirit. He taught us about tithing. He debunked old church myths. He used to say, stop shucking and shiving God. <laughs> Sometimes he would create interesting words out of the English language. Some of you know him. But we knew what he meant, and he was anointed. His wife taught the women from Scripture about raising children and being good wives. She was instrumental in opening the Christian school at the church, which required monthly scripture memorization. I'm sure both Pastor Matt and Pastor Adam remember Bible verses from those days. These pastors taught the word of God without compromise and flowed in the Holy Spirit. The church had an amazing children's church program. Volunteers ran it. My son still remembers it as Starship 91. <clears throat> there was a starship bridge with knobs and lights and buttons. <laughs> Kids could turn and click and punch to make the time machine work. And out of the time machine came Bible characters to give their account of what God did in their lives. My son got filled with the Holy Spirit and saved in that children's church. To the parents, neither Adam Ranny's parents or Pastor Matt's parents, would have ever thought of letting their kids skip church. The Rannies were in their seats. I think it was set up a little bit differently back then. <laughs> in the third row on the aisle every week. I don't know if the Ranny kids ever complained about going to church. I imagine they did. But looking back, I realized my kids didn't ask to skip church. It's just what we did. On Sundays and Wednesdays, we went to church, period. I know the Rannies well enough to know that they, like we, raised our kids and lived our lives according to the word of God. If the word said to tithe, we tithed. 
I know that both of our families went through difficult financial times. We didn't throw up our hands and say, oh, this tithing stuff doesn't work. We continued to give and to volunteer. The pastor continued to teach us the truth. If the word said how we were to raise our children, that's what we did. We didn't abuse our children. Mr. Ranny coached his boys in soccer. I directed my son in several children's musicals. We laughed with our kids, we loved our kids, we believed in our kids, and we taught them they could do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth, strengtheneth them. We just did what the Bible said. I'm going to call the worship team up to help us here. The point of the story is this. Neither the Rannies nor my family was perfect. Our pastor, as wonderful as he is, wasn't perfect. Our church was full of imperfect people, but they were sold out people. I wonder if Adam Ranny would be on TBN practically every time I turn it on, if his parents had said, oh, you can go to church if you want, or stay home, whatever, it's up to you. Probably not. I wonder if my son would be an anointed, world-changing pastor if I had treated my Christianity as a hobby. You know what a hobby is, right? You do it when you want and how you want to do it. Hobbyist Christians pray when they really need something. They go to church when it's convenient. And sometimes they do what the word says when it doesn't demand too much of them. Would my son be who he is today if I had been a hobbyist Christian? Probably not. Both the Rannies and my family avoided gray zones. We lived in black and white, right and wrong. If we didn't know what to do, we went to the word. We believed in absolute truth, not in a moving target of morality. That's how we raised our kids. We were sold out, fanatical, young, you might call us indefatigable Christian parents. And I'm thankful we were. I guess you could say we put Jesus at the 